Thank you. So in that decoupling of carbon emissions from development and growth, we have to do nothing short of reinventing our livelihoods, reinventing our workplaces, and the way we interrelate within society. Nothing short of that will hack that decoupling. Second of all, we have to approach this, and that, by the way, in a point to Kumi, means that political leaders have to work together with civil society and business to create the political space in which to maneuver and achieve a high degree agreement, uh, a high quality agreement in Copenhagen. Secondly, um, you know, this is going to take cathedral thinking with a sense of urgency. We're not going to solve this challenge overnight. Our forefathers built cathedrals with a vision that they would start working on them even if they didn't see them finished during their livelihoods. This is a marathon, not a hundred, not a hundred meter sprint. We need cathedral thinking with a sense of urgency because we need to begin working yesterday in terms of solving the issues. Can I just ask you very briefly then, do you think the cathedral will begin to be built in December? Well, today I feel much more optimistic than only three or four months ago. I see countries that are stepping up to the plate, new leadership in the United States, the Waxman, uh, Congressman Waxman's bill that was just approved out of the commission three weeks ago. Uh, I see China calling for the developed world to, be, to reduce its emissions by 40% by 2020. Good negotiating ploy, but already a very good beginning. I see countries much more willing to be engaged in the debate. I feel much more optimistic. I'm going to ask you, Naidu, do you feel optimistic that we're going to see leadership, high quality decisions, to use Jose Maria Figueres Olson's term, high quality decisions coming out of Copenhagen? Like Jose Maria, I want to be optimistic. But right now, the sense that many of us get is that we are rearranging the chairs on the Titanic while it is actually sinking. That in fact, the kind of urgency that is needed is still not strong enough. And I, and I think I'm on the same page with Joseph Maria, maybe slight uh, difference in terms of uh, how, we, how our sort of optimist, optimism index is. But overall, I think where we need it to be now is in a very different place. And the kind of leadership that we've needed and do need right now is firstly a leadership that is willing to speak truth is willing to actually say the unpopular things that need to be said right now. One of those unpopular things is to say to our brothers and sisters in rich countries that if we are to deliver the quality of life that you have in Western Europe and North America, we need eight planets to do that. And if we are going to be able to address the issue of the tragedy of the injustice of people in developing countries that are paying the biggest price, having been least responsible, that in fact we have to engage in, as the young people told us, painful change. We have to begin to recognize that we cannot live in a world, for example, where Western Europe and North America spends more on pet food annually uh, than what uh, would take to provide three nutritional meals for the people, uh, uh, every family in Africa. So those are the kinds of inequalities that need to be spoken about in an honest way. And let me say to each and every one of us here, those of us who come from the South are probably more in the elite part of the South. Those of us who come from the North uh, live in relative privilege. And unless we individually, as leaders, begin to start saying to ourselves the lifestyles that we have is unsustainable as well, and willing to actually communicate that in a public way, that is the kind of leadership that is needed. Secondly, on the issue of the negotiations itself, and the kind of leadership that is playing itself out. We've got a big problem there. Firstly, there are too many men in the negotiations. Uh, and I say that very seriously, that we have to begin to address the inequality in the global governance processes that we actually have. And the fact that, uh, you know, some of us were talking earlier and we said, you know, if you just change the gender dimension of the negotiators in Copenhagen, we might very well get a different result and much more quickly. Uh, the, the, the last point, the last point I wanted to make uh, and using Jose Maria's um, analogy of a marathon and a sprint. And I'm one of the people who always ends a lot of my speeches by saying the struggle against global poverty and global injustice is a marathon, not a sprint. And those of us that are involved must have perseverance, courage, and so on. But let me say 
that with climate change, we don't have a luxury to keep it a marathon any longer. That we have to actually get into a mode where we recognize that time is actually running out. And I want to conclude with a tribute to the young people that presented to us. Weren't they just terrific? Yes. I mean, I think we have to recognize as adult leadership that we failed ourselves, we are failing the current generation, and on the current track, unless we can mobilize young people to have more voice between now and Copenhagen to send a clear message to the political negotiators, we are stuck. And I want to appeal to all the older folks in the audience, as well as younger people, that we are now in a, have to, if you pardon me using a rather unfortunate analogy, we have to go into a war situation that we have to actually be recognizing that unless we change global public opinion and ensure that large numbers of people are putting pressure on the individual governments, then I do not believe we have a chance of getting the kind of ambitious deal that we need in Copenhagen. And that's a challenge for all of us. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we have two rather different views in front of us over here, and no doubt many different views, and many shades and nuances of opinion in the hall in front of us. You're going to have your chance to join in this debate in just a few minutes. We have Jose Maria Figueres Olson, rather more optimistic. He thinks things are changing. He's seen good signals coming out of the US and China, key players. And we have Kumi Naidu, who is beginning to despair, quite honestly, and he thinks we've got to turn to the young, different players. I am a journalist. What are journalists going to write just before Christmas in 2009? What are the headlines that are going to come out of the Copenhagen process? Nisha, can are I we going to see big cuts? Are we going to see small cuts? That's what it's going to be about. Are we going to see 40% cuts in global warming emissions? Or will there be 5%? That's what the headline writers are going to look for. That's what's going to go on the top of the news bulletins around the world. So I'm going to ask you guys, what do you think? Um, can I, well, Jose Maria first, you're the optimist. How high do you think the cuts Kumi, Kumi will be? Who wants to get something in uh, here in the space? I, I just wanted to close that last discussion by saying that I'm much more optimistic since President Bush left the White House and Obama came. Uh, I, I do think there is a different optimism, but it's not where it needs to be. Sorry. So he's an optimist, but... So, Jose Maria, people are going to judge it on those numbers. What do you think we'll see? Well, here. Michel, if, if, if you're waiting until the end of December to see what you're going to put on the headlines, I think you're not fulfilling your responsibility as a journalist. And what I want to say with that is that this is just too very important to be left in the hands of political leaders by themselves. This requires a multi-stakeholder coalition like we have never ever seen before if we are going to decouple growth from carbon emissions. Because the second war that we need to win in this century is the war against poverty, and therefore the need to continue to grow and fulfill the aspirations of peoples moving towards that low carbon economy. But this the reality requires much is, more the reality is that, that is what people want to hear. This that is how it's going to be judged. Kyoto gave us 5%. What is Copenhagen going to give us? That is how it is going to be judged. Kyoto, Do you really think we're going to see 40% cuts in global emissions? Kyoto 30%, was a very, 20%? Kyoto was a very good first earnest attempt at beginning to develop a framework through which we could move ahead on this issue. Not all countries lived up to their commitments or what to what we would have expected of them in Kyoto. But I'm not going to throw Kyoto out the window. I am going to say, let's build on what we have. We need to now move into a second generation agreement in Copenhagen. And part of the leadership that we need at Copenhagen is leadership that will decide at that point in time whether we have a high quality agreement or we have a mediocre agreement. And in that case, decide to meet again instead of going with a mediocre agreement. What I don't want coming out of Copenhagen is somebody said, ah, Costa Rica did the best they can, but then they switched and India came in and China said this and the US that, patati patata, and so we did the best we could. That gets political leadership off the hook. It takes the climate change issue off the immediate agenda, which is a luxury we cannot afford. Between a good agreement, I'm sorry, between no agreement at Copenhagen and mediocre agreement at Copenhagen, I prefer no agreement. That will put the onus on the leadership to reconvene and give us the quality agreement we need. Really? Yes.